Hi, I'm Gordon Raquel from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this is made possible by our sponsors, OWC. For more information on how they can assist you in your filmmaking needs, go to owcdigital.com. Uh, this week, I'm joined by editor Cheryl Potter, whose work includes Snowpiercer, The Alienist, Hannah, and The Nevers, uh, among so many other projects you've worked on. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. Uh, thanks. It's good to be here. Um, now, I noticed when I was going through your IMDb that you've also, you worked on a lot of uh, major projects. So like uh, Solo and um, The Martian and what have you as an additional editor. So what did you learn from those projects that you use uh, nowadays in your, your editing for other shows? Oh, um so much like so much of what I've learned from working with other editors I, I put into play like every day it's, it's mm -hmm. how to run a room how to sort of um, look to deliver on the notes like when you get when you get notes that don't necessarily make sense mm -hmm. to look for the note behind the note and figure out well what are we really getting at here okay you're saying you want to do this but actually um, maybe the problem is that you're trying to solve, maybe this isn't the right solve, but I can see from the note that this is where the problem is. Um, but so, so much of it about working under Pietro, working under Dodi Dawn, working under Mike McCusker, mm -hmm. um, it's not just about seeing how they edit and how they um, tell the story and how they put the pieces together. It's also about how they interact with the other filmmakers um, their uh, conversations with the director, the way they deal with visual effects, the way they deal with music. Uh, and so much of that informed me every day in, in how I work. And it was mm -hmm. like, that was how I learned how to be an editor was by working with these incredible editors. Wow. So it, like when you talk about running a room, I'm assuming you mean that process of dealing with the directors, the VFX artists and all that stuff. Um, and you, you also did some VFX editing earlier on in your career. So how do you work with the VFX department to, um, I guess, because when I look at the green screen footage, how do you determine like the length of the shot and all that stuff when you don't know necessarily what's going to go in there? Well, in the first instance, you just use the performance pieces that you have to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, so then it's about what are, what are they reacting to? How, how, what are they doing with their faces? What are they doing with their bodies? Place that and imagine what is missing. And then um, eventually, as you start, of, start to get the pieces that are missing, understand that the cut will change. Because once you can see the things that are going to fill that green screen, now all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, I want to hold on this shot longer because it's so beautiful. Or actually this thing that I thought was going to take three seconds only took two seconds. So now we've got to nip it and tuck it. Um, on the larger shows, there's almost always budget for previs. So you can like figure out how things are going to work. And, you know, sometimes you're very close to the previs. Like you might start putting the scene together and if you're missing shots, you'll, you'll use the previs shot in the meantime until you get the actual shot. Um, with the water fight sequence on the Nevers, which was an incredible like visual effects sequence that involved you know, shooting some stuff dry, shooting some stuff in a tank. Um, there was some stuff on green screen. There was some stuff on location. It was such an incredible, like, um, piece uh, uh, that took quite a long time, but it was very meticulously planned. So we had previews to work with initially. We recut the previews until we were happy with the flow of the shots. Then they went out and actually shot it, and I started piecing it together. And that was a situation where it's like, the real shot next to the previews and slotting in the pieces until you have all the pieces. Um, and that was, you know, I think a really good example, like working with um, Johnny and Jack on that because visual effects were involved at every step and they were really like making sure that we were going in the right way and getting the pieces that we need. Well, and like when I looked at your your work, like the Nevers or Snowpiercer, is there a particular genre or style of film or television show that attracts you when you're reading the scripts? So much is when, if I'm reading the scripts, if it grabs me, if I'm interested, if, oh, I love this character or this is pulling me in. 
I'm not necessarily like, oh, well, I have to, I, I'm only interested in certain genres. Um, I understand that comedy is a really like very particular skill set. And it's something that I haven't had a lot of experience in. So that's probably something that's outside of my wheelhouse. But aside from that, I, I would be happy to take on any genre um, because I, f I feel like it should be about the stories and the characters. That should be what draws you in. It shouldn't be, oh, well, I don't do period drama or I don't do sci-fi or it should be about what is it in the script that calls to you. But also so often it's like, oh, wow, this is a show I want to watch. This is, a, this is a show I want to be involved in because it's the kind of show that I would watch and I would enjoy. So for something like Snowpiercer, uh, did you read the comic or watch the original film before you started working on it? I'd already seen the film um, just as in passing because I think someone had recommended it to me. And then so when I was sent the script, I was already aware of, of the film. And it was interesting to see the difference between like what, where the TV show had chosen to place its focus versus the film and how they had taken this world and this existing, you know, story that had been told before. And like, well, we're gonna focus on a different part of it and find a way to make it, um, to, to fill it out and draw out stories that we'll be able to keep telling. Because the way the story is told in the film, by the time you get to the end of the film, like, you know, that's kind of the end of the story. Whereas, you know, with a, with a television series, you wanna be able to have these continuing stories that flow on and, and keep people engaged. Now, so on Snowpiercer, uh, because it was uh, uh, Bong Joon-ho's film, um, they, so in Korea, they have on-set editor. So it's actually a separate role from the editor. Uh, do you ever see that sort of becoming a part of uh, more Western filmmaking styles? I, I can definitely see it uh, shifting over. And I remember when we were working on Australia, years and years back that we actually had an editor that we ended up putting on set because the way that that film was shot, they shot a bunch of stuff on location and then they went and shot um, more stuff for the same scenes in studio. Mm -hmm. And so it, that was a situation where it made a lot of sense to have an editor on set, dropping stuff in and making sure things pieced together and making sure things worked. So I've already seen that happen and mm -hmm. I can see it continuing to happen um, because it's, it's such a useful tool and the technology enables us to do that now because, you know, back when we were doing it on Australia, I think we were able to get like digital video tap, but it was still, you know, video tap. It wasn't a, a feed from the camera. It was um, a, a lower quality uh, piece of footage that eventually mm -hmm. after it had been put together, someone would have to go and cut in the actual footage because um, that was just the flow of things back then. But as technology gets better and better, I can absolutely see a situation where it's like, if we have the ability to view, which we do already, if you can see it, then there is an assumption that you can cut it. And so if you can put in the infrastructure to be able to do that, then like, if it's, if it's valuable and it's useful and you have a director who wants that, I don't see a reason not to. No. In, in your career, you've worked on a lot of great shows and you mentioned <clears throat> the water fight scene in The Nevers. Is there a scene that you found particularly hard to edit and afterwards you were sort of proud of how it came out and that you sort of used an example of your work? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, that is a good one. I think there've been a lot of situations where I've been presented with a problem um, after the fact, you know, like when you're sort of down the line and you've already sort of cut the show as it was shot. And then there's a situation of, well, now we have a, like a script problem or we have a story problem that is not something that we identified before we shot it. And now we're trying to fix it. Um, and so there's been quite a few instances of that. And um, there's actually a sequence in The Alienist. And I remember um, uh, my producer, my executive producer, Ben Rosenblatt, came to me and there's a sequence where um, Dakota Fanning is, is like just sitting at her desk and she's looking over some books. Um, and then her uh, assistant comes in and uh, tries to get her to eat something because she's working too hard and then she sort of leaves. And that was all that scene was about initially. 
Um, and then Ben was saying, look, we, we want to have another moment where we're looking at um, flashes to like the, the crime that she's trying to solve. And we had some footage that had been shot for another moment in another episode that we ended up not using. And so he was proposing, well, could we just have her, um, instead of reading these books, could she be looking at this, looking at sketches from the footage and can we include some of these flashes to, to moments of the crime so that we understand that she's trying to solve the crime in this scene? And my initial thought was, oh, I don't know if this is going to work. It feels like it's a bit ham-fisted, like trying to squeeze these flashes into this scene that was a very, like I didn't have a lot of coverage and it was, that's not what it was designed to do. But I was like, you know what? Always try. Like, even if you think something's not going to work, you have to try and you have to give it your best go because you just never know. And I remember putting it together and then kind of like starting out being very doubtful, but still trying anyway. And then I remember showing him and after we both looked at it, we are like, that actually works, and it's in the episode to this day. <laughs> Wait, he so he proposed it, and then he was like, "Oh, you know what? It actually does work afterwards." Yeah, well, well it was just <laughs> one of those things that, like, sometimes you get a note, and you're like, "Oh, that's not a very good note," but how can we solve it? And you start to kind of just throwing ideas around. You're like, "Oh, that's that might be a bit hokey," but then it was yeah. like it just came together, and it wasn't hokey, and it did work. You mentioned that, like, you know, a lot of people. It's like we've shot it. Here's a problem now. How do we solve it? But when you get a script, um, how do you? I guess how do you mark it up? How do you go through it uh, to make notes for yourself and and sort of communicate to the director or the producer that there might be extra stuff that's needed there. That's um, it's really. I think that's probably something that is more common in uh, in feature films because you have more time, like. In television, I feel like because you have so many voices and the, something that I, that I remember being really surprised by when I made this, like when I was working in television shows after working in features for so long was that script updates just coming through constantly. Like in the lead up to shooting scenes, they'll be revising scenes and sending new versions of scenes. And so there's, there's this process that it's like, it's never set in stone. Like they're always revising, they're always coming up with new ideas. Um, and just slightly shifting and adjusting the scenes in the lead up to shooting them. So it, it, in some ways that means that you've never really got the thing. Like you, you could see an overarching problem if there's something like, oh, well, we just lose this character for the second half of the episode. Or if there's a, like a big ticket item that's very clear overall in the script, then that's like a conversation to be had. But like the smaller little things that you might pick up on, I feel like in television, because it's such this moving tide, so often it, I think it's harder to identify those issues until you actually do have, okay, here's the footage of the scene of the version that they actually shot, that that's when sort of things might come to light. So in terms of preparations, like usually for me, it's just about reading it and getting familiar with it and talking about it. So what, why did you make the change from film to, to TV? Um, because I wanted to cut and that was the, the sort of the, the quickest way in. And I feel like the line between features and television now is so blurry that it doesn't feel like a one way step like it maybe once was because I'd still like to do features and I, I still want to keep a foot in the features camp. It's just the way that it's kind of rolled out for me was at the point where I said, I don't want to keep being an additional and working under another editor. I'd like to just edit my own things. The mm -hmm. first opportunity that came up for me was Hannah. It was television. And that rolled onto Snowpiercer, which rolled onto um, Alienist, which rolled onto the net. It was just like once I kind of done did one, it flowed to the other, to the other, to yeah. the other. But th there still have been, you know, opportunities for features as well within all that. And I still would like to do features for sure. It's just finding the right one. And at the moment, I just take each uh, project on its merits and what I'm most interested in and, and which ones call to me. And it's just so happened that the ones that I've ended up on have been the television ones. Well, it's interesting because it, it almost feels like um, television also gives you more room to work story-wise, right? Because you're not confined to 90 minutes or two and a half hours you're confined to a whole season and then another season if it gets picked up and what have you so 
in those situations because i've talked to some editors and they're depending on who the showrunner is they're privy to what's coming because they have to set things up but sometimes they're not so how do you (laughs) work with you know scenes to set up other episodes or how do you communicate with producers and what have you or showrunners to ensure that you're getting that that cut right for the right impact two episodes later well i mean i'll always read all the scripts like i'll Mm -hmm. always be across it from that perspective and i've been really lucky in that and the shows that I've worked on thus far, there's always been great communication between the editors. And I think that's part of what is really great about working in television. It's like, you're not the only editor, there are other editors and you can sort of throw um, ideas around and and check in with people. And there's been many, many times where it's like, I'll pop into the other editor or they'll pop into me and say, hey, so the last time we saw this character before the scene that I'm about to cut, this happened. what was the vibe there? Were they happy? Were they angry? Like, how did this come about? And you're just kind of comparing notes and making sure that there's a flow through to um, not only the storytelling side, but also the character's headspace, where they're at, how the relationships are working. Because if you've Mm -hmm. got them, two characters who've had a big fight in episode three, and then the next time you see them in episode four, they're acting like nothing happened. Like that's, that's a bit of a miss. So you need to find ways to, to smooth that all out. How, like, I guess that sort of, uh, well, it kind of answers this question already, but I was going to talk about how do you build uh, a working relationship with multiple editors? Because usually on a, like on a feature, there's the lead editor and you're sort of following their thing. But in this, it's like each person has their own episode. So how do you work together to create sort of that uniform feel to the film or uniform tone? Well, I think it, it is, it's just, it's just talking with each other, but also like it's, it's that first episode or that first two episodes mm-hmm. that usually they're the ones, especially if it's a first run series, because that's where they're really finding, okay, this is, this is the rhythm and this is the tone and this is how we want to tell the story. And so not only like keeping up with those decisions that are being made, watching those first episodes mm-hmm. and then keeping in mind, you know, if, if they're using a lot of dissolves or they're using a lot of fast cuts or you you don't want to be cutting like episode three and four of episode like completely different from episode one and two Mm -hmm. like by the time I came on to Snowpiercer in season one like episode one was you know pretty filled out so I was Mm -hmm. able to like sit down and watch that and see oh okay there's this, this feeling of rhythm and shakiness. They're using some handheld angles and it feels very claustrophobic and the cutting patterns and styles that the editor Jay had been using. It's like, okay, I'm going to pay attention to this and make sure the way I put my episodes together is, is talking to this and, and that we're in the same world. Now, um, when you... When you get the rushes for these projects, what do you look for in a performance uh, when you're trying to make a choice? It's it's that first reaction that you have when you're watching it. So I try and watch all the dailies and I try to watch them in order of shoot. If I have time, then I think that's incredibly valuable because you can see how the performance develops over the course of the shoot. And it's how you respond when you're watching it. If there's a take that... The first time you saw it made you laugh or the first time you saw it gave you an emotional reaction. You're like, I've got to remember that. And then I'll note it or I'll put a locator on it. And when I come back around to cutting the scene, it might be take six was amazing. And take six just really took my breath away. And I'm going to build this, this scene around being able to use that take and dwell on that take Mm. because that's the one that gave me that, you know, very emotional reaction when I watched it the first time. So trying to retain and remember those first responses to the performance, I think that's the purest way. And then also, you know, you're going to have your script supervisor's notes and and input from the director as well Mm -hmm. that will help guide you. But I think there's something about just sit down and watch and respond and pay attention to what you're responding to. Now, what's something you've learned in your career that you wish you had known when you started? Oh, I think, I think that trusting your gut 
trusting your first instinct Mm -hmm. because I think it takes a while for you to stop going oh wait hang on like oh they shot this other thing maybe I should use this this other thing or you know you you might have a a a beautiful crane shot but it's happening at a moment in the scene when you really just want to be in tight and close Mm -hmm. and if your first gut instinct is well I want to be in tight and close and you put the scene together that way and you're like oh but they shot this very impressive shot maybe I need to use it. And that's, that's when you're questioning like, oh, that's, that's when you're not following your gut. Mm. And at least in the first instance, just trust, trust your sort of gut instinct and the way that you put things together. And if you need to course correct later, then course correct later. But the number of times early on that I would put something together and I'd be constantly like second guessing, oh, maybe they wanted it this way, or maybe the director wants this, or, well, they shot all these extra shots, so I should use them. And it's like, no, just because then you'd put it together that way and it it wouldn't work or you'd show it to them and be like, oh, no, it's too cutty or Mm -hmm. like just just trust your instincts, trust your gut, put it together the way that feels right to you in the first instance at the very least. So I have one last question that I ask everyone I've been interviewing. Uh, You know, we've been stuck in this pandemic for going on two years now. And... um, you know, during that time, people have really turned to streaming services for entertainment when they're stuck at home. So is there a show or a movie you've discovered over the last uh, year and a bit that you think people should check out? Oh, if people haven't seen Mare of Town yet, then okay. like get into that. I mean, oh, wow, that was so good. And I think it was it came off the back of I'd watched in a run quite a few sort of sci-fi and fantasy and sort of otherworldly series. Mm-hmm. And then just like sat down and watched Mare of Easttown and just to, to, to spend some time like in a grounded drama that was very real and very like I just I was so ready for that mm-hmm. and it was so beautifully crafted and like the editing and the performances and, and it was just a real example of like what well, just really well done it was so so well done yeah. well thank you so much for letting me interview you today it was so great to to <laughs> do this and to meet you thank you And that's it for this week. Uh, Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com. And of course, check out our uh, sponsors at OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking needs. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching.